for having me here today. I'm very pleased to be here. You know, I'm usually rather shy and, and reserved about my personal life, but if talking about it here today will help to stop the senseless destruction of animal and plant life that I see is becoming so pervasive around us, then I'm happy to oblige. I wanted to start by telling you about this medal that I have. I got this medal from the Animal Welfare League, which was started by that great humanitarian, Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Dr. Schweitzer was a person who coined the phrase, reverence for life. And that phrase, that concept of reverence for life has been so important to me. Do you know, we are part of this web of life. As soon as we start destroying various strands of it, we are in danger of destroying the entire web. It seems that in America today, and perhaps in the rest of the world too, we have lost focus. For instance, recently I was on the CBS Reports show about Silent Spring and the controversy that was generated by my book. And there was a scientist on there from one of the chemical companies, and he was wearing his white lab coat and his big thick glasses, and he said in his deep voice, he said, well, Miss Carson says that we need to concern ourselves with the balance of nature. But I say that mankind no longer can, needs to worry about that. We and our wisdom can control nature. And I said then, and I say again today, we might as well say that we could repeal the law of gravity as to say that we no longer need to worry about the balance of nature. <laughs> Really, this concern goes back, and this deep feeling for it, goes back from my earliest childhood. I was born in 1907 in a little town, Springdale, Pennsylvania, in western Pennsylvania. It was only about 15 miles outside of Pittsburgh. And my father, Robert, and my mother, Maria, and my sister, Marion, she's 10 years older than me, and my brother, Robert, who was eight years older than me, all moved to this lovely plot of land, 64 whole acres of land, on the beautiful Allegheny River. And there were woods, and there was meadows, and I was able to roam this beautiful countryside all on my own from a very early age with just my little dog to accompany me. And I love to look at the little tiny bugs in the fields, the insects and the birds and the trees. I've always been a great bird lover. I learned about nature from a very early age and I loved it. And my father's plan had been to sell part of the land and then support our family that way. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to do that, unfortunately, in some ways, because that meant that he had to go to work in the mill. But fortunately, in other ways, because I had the land to roam on, I had this wonderful childhood in nature. And we had farm animals, too. And one of my jobs was to go out and pluck the eggs out from under the chickens. And I would bring those eggs, still warm, from the chickens into my mother. And she would make me breakfast. <laughs> my fresh eggs gathered right from under our own chickens. That's a lovely memory I have. My mother had been a school teacher and before she married and settled down with us children. And she loved to teach me and the rest of my family about nature. She would read to me books about nature. She taught me to read from an early age. And I decided when I was about eight years old to write my first book. I wrote a little book called The Little Brown Wren and I illustrated it with some drawings that I made and I gave it to my father for his birthday. And he loved it. And from that moment on, I thought, I think I'm going to be a writer when I grow up. When I was 10, I entered a writing contest that was sponsored by St. Nicholas Magazine, and I won first prize. I was paid $10. So I took my $10 prize, and I went out and I bought treats and presents for my family, and I said to myself, well, this is easy. I can be a writer and support myself. Well, from that moment on, I wrote more. I wrote several more stories and sent them into St. Nicholas, and they published them, and again, I was paid for them. And I wrote for our high school yearbook. Um, it was just delightful. Well, by and by, I graduated from high school, and I dearly wanted to go to college. 
But my family was so poor, we really couldn't afford to send me to college. So my mother, she thought, well, I'll sell the family china. She had gotten it for her wedding and it was important to her, but she let go of it for my sake. My father mortgaged some of our land and the school, Pennsylvania College for Women, gave me a large scholarship and I was able to go to school. Well, there I was in Pittsburgh, only a 15 mile train ride from home. And every other weekend, I would go home to my family and every other weekend, my mother would come and stay with me at school and learn about my studies and meet my friends. And we had a wonderful time. And everything was going great. I had really decided to be a writer and was studying English when, in the middle of my sophomore year, I had to take a class in biology. I thought, I don't want to take sciences, but the school required it, and so I took it. And it changed my life. <laughs> My teacher was so good and she took us on field trips and she took us out in the woods and showed us everything that I had seen as a child, but now she explained how it worked together. And she showed us under the microscope how things worked. And I determined, I'm not going to be a writer after all, I'm going to be a biologist. Well, when I told my family and my other teachers this, you would have think I would have told them that I was going to drop out of school and be a bum. They were so upset with me. They said, Rachel, there's no jobs for women in science. You stick with this, well, stick with writing. But I was determined I couldn't do anything else now. And so I went into science and I studied very hard for the rest of my school years and I graduated. And I had two wonderful things to look forward to at graduation. One was I won a scholarship to the Woods Hole Marine Laboratory at Cape Cod, Massachusetts for the summer. I was so excited because even though we li only live 300 miles from the ocean, I had never been to the ocean, but my whole life I had been excited about the ocean. I had read stories about it. I had dreamed of it. I had this wonderful shell that my mother had. She had gotten this shell from a friend of hers in Florida. And I used to sit and listen to the ocean in this shell for hours at a time. And so now, for the first time, I got to go there. And it was as wonderful as I thought it would be. The waves were crashing against the shore. You could see the gulls flying overhead. The smell was intoxicating. For two months, I was in heaven. And it changed my life because not only did I decide I would be a biologist, but I would be a marine biologist. And then I had another great thing to do, and that was I was going to Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland to continue my studies. And I was there for a little while, everything was going all right, and I realized I was feeling sad. And the reason was that I missed my family terribly. I had never been away from them for so long. And so I contacted them. I said, what if you come and live with me here in Baltimore and we'll all live together again like we had in the past? And they agreed. And it wasn't very long before my mother and my father, my sister Marion, who had married and divorced with the two children, Virginia and Marjorie, wonderful little girls, moved in with me. Then I had my family all together again, and it was so wonderful for me. I was working in the lab as a laboratory assistant while I was doing my studies. And things were going along pretty well for a few years there. When one July day in 1935, my father came into the kitchen in the morning and he said to my mother, Maria, I'm not feeling very good. My chest hurts, my head hurts. I can't catch my breath. She said, well, Robert, just go out in the yard and get a little air. You probably just need some fresh air. He always did what she told him. So he went out in the yard and he was standing there. And she was watching him through the window when she suddenly saw him collapse on the ground in front of her. Oh, she ran out in the yard and she put his head in her lap and he looked at her and he said, Maria, I think I'm dying. Goodbye, I love you. And he died right there in her arms. After that, 
well, it was very hard because we were so poor we couldn't even afford for my mother to go on the train with his casket back to the family graveyard in Pennsylvania. And I realized now I had to bring in a lot more money for the family. So I couldn't just work part-time at the university anymore. I had to go and get a regular job. I decided to go to the Department of Fisheries in Washington and apply for a job there. And I walked in, I saw Mr. Higgins, I talked to him for a while. He said, you know, Miss Carson, you would be wonderful in our department. The problem is we don't even have jobs for men scientists right now. This is the depression after all. And I'm sorry to say we can't use you. I started to leave. And then he said, but wait, can you write? Because we really need a writer. I said, can I write? Of course I can write. I was so excited when he said that. He said, well, because we have these radio scripts that we have to produce, and all of us scientists here, we can't write worth a darn. How about if you take these pieces of work home and see what you can do? So I took them home, and my mother and I worked on the scripts, and we liked what we did, and I took it back to my chief, Mr. Higgins, and he liked it, and he said, you're hired. Well, for the next 17 years, I worked for the Department of Fisheries, which became the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I worked my way up through the department to where I was the head editor of all their publications. Well, things were going along pretty well, and then in 1937, early in the year, my sister Miriam got pneumonia and passed away so suddenly. It was very sad for all of us, especially her two daughters, Virginia and Marjorie were only 10 and 11, and now my mother and I had to take care of them full time, and I became the sole financial support for our family. I wasn't quite sure what to do. I sent in an article that I had been working on to Atlantic Monthly, and they accepted it for publication. It's called Undersea, and I'd like to read to you from it. Undersea. Who has known the ocean? Neither you nor I with our earthbound senses know the foam and surge of tide that beats over the crab, hiding under the seaweed of his tide pool home, or the lilt of the long, slow swells of mid-ocean where shoals of wandering fish prey and are preyed upon, and the dolphin breaks the waves to breathe the upper atmosphere. Nor can we know the vicissitudes of life on the ocean floor, where the sunlight, filtering through a hundred feet of water, makes but a fleeting bluish twilight, in which dwell sponge and mollusk and starfish and coral, where swarms of diminutive fish twinkle through the dusk like a silver rain of meteors, and eels lie in wait among the rocks. Even less is it given to us to descend those six incomprehensible miles into the recess of the abyss where reign utter silence and unvarying cold and eternal night. So, it was amazing what happened after that. All my writing career followed from that. Within a few weeks, I got a letter from a publisher. They wanted me to write a whole book about life under the sea gave me a small advance, and I was on my way. I didn't realize how long it would take me to produce a book while I was working full time. But after five years of writing and rewriting, finally I came out with my book, Under the Sea Wind. I was very happy with it, so was my publisher, and so were the critics. But unfortunately, Under the Sea Wind came out in November of 1941. And you probably know what happened in December of 1941, that's when Pearl Harbor happened. After Pearl Harbor, when the U.S. entered World War II, nobody had time or energy or excitement to read my book. I only sold a thousand copies and I said to myself, I'm never writing another book. But you know how life goes sometimes after a few years, I realized I really wanted to write another book about the sea and this was going to be a biography of the sea. I found a wonderful agent who said she would help me get good publicity for my work this time, and I wrote and wrote nights and weekends, and I wrote The Sea Around Us, and that came out in 1951, and it changed my life. 
my book went to the top of the New York Times bestseller list and stayed there for 86 weeks. And the republished Under the Sea Wind also went to the bestseller list. And I went from being this obscure government worker to a celebrity of sorts. <laughs> it was strange for me because, as I've said, I was a very reserved person. One day I was at my hairdresser's and I was sitting under the dryer. And as I was sitting there, a woman came up to me and she lifted up the hood of the hairdryer and she said, you're Rachel Carson, I recognize you from your publicity. Would you please sign this autograph for myself and my daughter? We're so excited about your work. People recognized me on the street. I got all these awards. I was asked to speak here and there. And one of the most wonderful things was that I had enough money where I could stop working for the government and just be a writer. And I was delighted in that I was able to take some of the money that I made from my book and buy some land in Maine. My mother and I used to go to Maine and stay for a few days in a cabin up there. And now we built a little cottage that we could be in in the summer. It was wonderful. There was a big window overlooking the ocean. The moon would rise right out of the ocean. We could go down to the rocky beach and collect specimens and show them to my little grandnephew, Roger, and then take them back, put them back where they belonged in the world. I just loved it there. And one of the best things also that happened there was I met my best friend, Dorothy. Dorothy Freeman, she became so close to me. We just couldn't see enough of each other when we were together there in the summer. And then over the winter, when we were separated, we wrote letters to one another, we phoned each other, we were constantly in communication and it was lovely. And I, I, Dorothy just means so much to me. She's been such a help to me in my life. Well, there I was. I had written the, those two books about the sea and a publisher came to me and said, why not write about the edge of the sea? Because you've written these books about life in the sea and under the sea, and how about along the shore? Because that's where most of us spend our time when we go to the sea. And I thought, yes, you're right. And I already had a lot of research, and since I didn't have to work at my other job, I was able to just complete my book in just a couple of years. And that's when I brought out the edge of the sea. And that also was met with great acclaim because people really want to know about the world around them. And even though I am a scientist, I wrote in a way that was appealing to the average person who wasn't really interested in scientific terms, but liked very much to know how all the world works together in this beautiful web of life. felt very good about my books about the sea. And I was finished writing about the sea at last. Now I was ready to start writing about the evolution of life on land, because this is also very fascinating to me and has been for a long time. And just as I started to write this book, I got a letter from my friend Olga Huggins. And she and her husband, bird lovers extraordinaire, and they had this beautiful bird reserve on their property in Connecticut. And Olga said to me, I was in my backyard one day recently filling the bird feeders, and a plane flew low overhead and spewed out all this terrible chemical. I think it was probably DDT. And I ran into the house to escape it, but the birds at the feeders and at their nests could not escape it. And they dropped to the ground, fluttering and, and shivering and died right there in front of me. And this is a terrible catastrophe. And since you have the eye and the ear of the public, they trust you in these matters about nature and science. And since you've worked for the government, perhaps you can do something about this situation. And so I thought, I don't really want to write about this very much, but it has to be done. And I'll write an article, I'll send it off, and we'll see what happens. 
And so I started writing an article about this, and as soon as I did, people from all over the country, and in fact all over the world, fed me information telling me about these dangerous pesticides that were being unleashed on the countryside around us, and all the insects and the birds and the amphibians that were dying from some of these horrible sprays. And I realized that I couldn't just write a simple article. This was much bigger than that, that I had to write another book. And so I began writing Silent Spring. And it was, came at a very difficult time in my life because my niece Marjorie, she had diabetes and she got, went into a diabetic coma and passed away so suddenly. Her son Roger was only five years old and he had to come and live with us full time my mother and I had to take care of him. And then my mother, she got sick and she died. Then, as well as all the other people getting sick, I myself was feeling bad. I went to the doctor and he diagnosed me with cancer. It's been very difficult. But as I said, I had to continue writing this book because it was so important to myself, to the world around us. After six long years of writing, Silent Spring was ready for publication. And the chemical companies went to my publishers, Hoot Mifflin and The New Yorker, which was serializing it, and said, we are going to sue you for libel if you publish these books. But they stood strong. They believed in me and my writing, and they knew how important it was. Finally, Silent Spring came out, and it went immediately to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. I was so happy that the public was embracing my work. The chemical companies reacted very strongly. They accused me of being this addle brain spinster, of being this silly nature lover and cat lover and bird lover and what did I know what I was talking about? I didn't even have a doctorate and so forth. And while most of Silent Spring deals with the dangers of these pesticides and chemicals unleashed in our environment, the last chapter talks about the alternatives. And I'd like to read to you from that last chapter. It's called The Other Road. We stand now where two roads diverge, but unlike the roads in Robert Frost's familiar poem, they are not equally fair. The road we have long been traveling is deceptively easy, a smooth superhighway on which we progress with great speed, but at its end lies disaster. The other fork of the road, the one less traveled by, offers our last our only chance to reach a destination that ensures the preservation of our Earth. The choice, after all, is ours to make. If, having endured much, we have at last asserted our right to know, and if, knowing, we have concluded that we are being asked to take senseless and frightening risks, then we should no longer accept the counsel of those who tell us that we must fill our world with poisonous chemicals we should look about and see what other course is open to us. A truly extraordinary variety of alternatives to the chemical control of insects is available. Some are already in use and have achieved brilliant success. Others are in the stage of laboratory testing. And still others are little more than ideas in the minds of imaginative scientists waiting for the opportunity to put them to the test. All have this in common. They are biological solutions based on understanding of the living organisms they seek to control and of the whole fabric of life to which these organisms belong. So much has happened in this short time since Silent Spring came out. President Kennedy has called for investigations into these matters. The Senate has held hearings in which I and other scientists got to testify about the horrors of some of these chemicals. It's been very exciting and very moving. I know that we are working on beautiful and wonderful solutions to these problems that don't involve the destruction 
of so much of our wonderful world. After all, we are very, very intelligent creatures. And for us to continue to destroy the world around us in this way is not intelligent. Well, <clears throat> now I come to a part of my story that's hard for me to tell, really. You see, I've recently been to the doctor, and he's told me that the cancer in my body is progressing, and I don't have much longer to be here. I'm afraid that my days are numbered. And it's going to be up to you to do what you can to carry on this work to preserve this amazing and, and intricate world around us. I want to leave you now with an excerpt of a letter that I wrote to my dear friend Dorothy not long ago. Dear one, for me, it was one of the loveliest of the summer's hours, and all the details will remain in my memory. That blue September sky, the sound of the wind and the spruces and surf on the rocks, the gulls busy with their foraging, alighting with deliberate grace. But most of all, I shall remember the monarchs, that unhurried westward drift of one small winged form after another, each drawn by some invisible force. We talked a little about their migration, their life history. Did they return? We thought not. For most, at least, this was the closing journey of their lives. But it occurred to me this afternoon, remembering that it had been a happy spectacle, that we had felt no sadness when we spoke of the fact that there would be no return. And rightly, for when any living thing has come to the end of its life cycle, we accept that end as natural. For the monarch, that cycle is measured in a known span of months. For ourselves, the measure is something else, the span of which we cannot know. But the thought is the same. When that intangible cycle has run its course, it is a natural and not unhappy thing that a life comes to its end. And that is what those brightly fluttering bits of life taught me this morning. I found a deep happiness in it, and so I hope may you. Thank you for having me here today.